Well, I suppose asset transfer at the moment primarily seems to be around property and property that maybe government or statutory bodies have no longer any any use for and if those could then be transferred to the community where they could be put to some positive use then that seems a kind of win-win situation so broadly I am really in support of that um, and I think anything government can do at the moment to make that happen you know is good but I think the context I would put it in is that to me a property asset is just like any other asset and government has been transferring millions and millions of pounds of um, assets into communities for many, many years, as long as I've been involved, it's about 30 years, and much of that goes into property. You're sitting in one now, where, where this is a building bought with um, assets that have come from uh, government departments of around £800,000, and it's now a building. So for me, there's no real difference between that happening and government transferring a building worth £800,000. They're basically the same end result. So I suppose for me, I, I just think it's not... It's nothing new, nothing for civil servants to be, or ministers or politicians, to be frightened of. It's just a slightly different way of doing what they've always been doing. So what you're suggesting here is that there's some, there's some blockage? I think it's probably some kind of administrative blockage. I mean, one simple blockage then, I suppose, the government department that may own the property uh, may not be engaged in any activity where they're uh, normally transferring any kind of assets local community to do something. So I suppose there needs to be some way of how do you administer this inside government so that where all the properties are held, that somehow the value of those properties are still used for the benefit of whatever that department or agency happens to be. Um, so a good example of that is at the moment DSD seem to take on some properties that other statutory bodies have that they've no use for and there's not much market value in. And then DSD, I think, are quite effective in, in moving those on for community use. But at the moment, they tend to do that just through a publicised development brief. So anybody in the any private sector, people might come and do that. There's some social benefits. I think what's being looked at now is that some of those could be transferred, perhaps at no value uh, or, or at no cost to an organisation that may have some very clear idea what to do with them and that that would fit very much today with DSD policy. So I think that that kind of administrative thing does maybe need some legislation around it. But I do think they're making a wee bit of a meal of it because it's, there's no big principle at stake here. Um, and I mean, I think I, I mentioned an example to you before of Tamar Avenue School around here, which was in DSD ownership, having come from one of the education authorities, I think as part of one of these PFI initiatives. Um, it probably only had a value of 80,000 it couldn't actually be transferred to the project, even though that same department was putting two million into the project. So there's obviously no problem in principle about transferring an asset, but there just wasn't a process there. So I would have thought ministers and civil servants could pretty quickly put a process in place that is just a simple way of doing something they've been doing for, for generations. Of course, property transfer is quite a major heavy duty piece of uh uh, way of doing it, if you like. Mm. Um, but there, there, there are other sort of examples of um, asset transfer that don't necessarily um, changing the title of the building, etc. Yeah, I mean, I think local authorities tend to do this, and, and East Belfast, Belfast City Council has done that say, with Temper Avenue Baths. Now, I'm not, I'm not privy to all the kind of arrangements around that, and no doubt someone could tell you that. But by and large, I think they've transferred the management of that across to a users group. Um, probably with some grant aid with that, and then the user group have run it. And the alternative to that was closing it, which would have taken away a facility that at that stage was heavily used by mainly young people, I suppose, who were involved in competitive swimming, um, or upgrading the whole thing at huge expense to um, the ratepayer and then running it at, at, at a quite, you know, quite expensive rate. One of the things that a community group can do, because people might ask, why could a community group run something more cheaply than a local authority? in our case Belfast City Council and that's not just that you know councils are very um, inefficient in how they operate and community groups are really efficient if only that was true you know as it's not but what community groups can do can bring on some voluntary involvement because people actually want to keep the facility open and that can keep the cost down and also they tend not to have the kind of 
um, longer term terms and conditions for, for staff, etc., that do make sometimes the facility get very expensive. When we were talking earlier on, you mentioned a, a project in Sheffield that you went to recently. Yep, I went to see uh, it, a project in Sheffield, which was, was an old Victorian swimming pool, which are not normally regarded as, you know, assets that groups are looking to run because they're very expensive to run and to maintain. So it was an old Victorian swimming pool, a library, and a community centre, so quite a big facility. And this group here, I think, are called Zest. They took that on and run them all in an integrated way and have got really, I mean, the place was just buzzing when I was in it. They'd opened a wee cafe, the swimming pool was being used, in that case by a Somali women's group. The, the gym was being used by a, a group of very elderly people who you know, just wanted to operate in an environment where there weren't all the young people there. Um, the library, um, and this might be slightly contribution, uh, controversial, but... Um, you know, they, they no longer, I think they were looking at a situation where they no longer had any library staff because that, uh, so there was library staff, like, you know, proper librarians deciding what books went in and what the processes were, but it was all self, it was all self ticketed. So when you then to get a book, you just ran it through a scanner. So the only staff were the reception staff for the centre. So really that made the library, well, two things it did. It made the library much more cost effective. You weren't paying high professional librarian staff to actually put books in and out. But the second thing it did, it introduced people to the library who maybe never set foot in the library. They were in there for mum and toddlers group, they were in there for a swim, they were in for a cup of coffee, they were in as part of a youth project. So there were lots of people using the building, moving through the library. And actually Templemore Avenue School, uh, which is a completely different project in East Belfast, um, is talking to the library service and be really keen to see them do something similar there. It's interesting, that, just to pick you up on that, that point about replacement of professional staff with well, no service really, yeah. in a sense, yeah. and I, I think some of the some of the political sensitivities around this is that uh, these are hard times. Cuts are having to be made. Minister, ministers, to be fair to them, are making cuts they don't necessarily want to make. Mm -hmm. That in some ways this is just covering up the skirts of government, uh, and and you know communities taking over things that government has just decided it doesn't have money for anymore. Yeah, and I think that is part of the agenda, and I think that needs needs to be watched against. But that doesn't necessarily mean that therefore you know, it can't be looked at, because at the end of the day, I mean, government is spending money that you and I are paying in Texas, so we want things to be done as efficiently as possible, as cost effectively as possible, and with as good quality as possible. So so long as you know, as long as government isn't dumping assets which become liabilities in local communities, which is a potential danger then I think it's something that definitely needs explored because as, as a taxpayer, as well as something involved in the community, if the community can run something more cost effectively than government and with better quality, then I don't think the protection of professional jobs is the only issue to be looked at in there, although it is an important issue. But you do raise, a, you do raise another important issue, which is the liability, the millstone yeah. kind of thing. And um, you were suggesting earlier on that, that in scaling up the opportunity mm. uh, in public terms and making this more of an offering, making it easier for people to get involved, um, that this is opening up also potential dangers. Yeah, I mean, you could, I mean, running the building, as I know, we, we run a number of buildings here, some of them with shared, you know, shared, shared usage. Um, you, you do need to, to run it, you do need to manage it effectively. Um, uh, there are all kinds of legal responsibilities around that, and that could sink an organisation. You know, an organisation set up to provide a service suddenly landed with a building, they've never managed a building before. Um, so I think government needs to be careful, and, and the community needs to be careful, that we don't enter into arrangements that simply aren't, they, they aren't, they aren't workable or they aren't sustainable, because uh, that will then give the whole thing a bad kind of press, and then it could be withdrawn altogether. Well, uh, just to kind of wind down towards the end of the interview, what, what can actually be done to kind of mediate those kinds of risks? Um, well, I think there can be, at, at this stage where it's being looked at, then I think you know, those can be identified. Um, and I think to identify them, the best way to do that is to talk to people on the ground who are potentially in the market to receive some of the assets um, and to talk to some people who are obviously in government civil servants who have responsibility for public accountability so that they don't do something that, that doesn't work and to somehow that that's, you know, those processes are independently facilitated might help. Thanks Morris.